the Lord a hand clap of praise. Blessed be his name. Thank you, choir. God bless you for singing tonight. What a thought to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We don't have to wonder about if we're saved. We don't have to base our salvation off of how we feel because feelings change from time to time. Sometimes you may be going through the valley of the shadow of death and you just do not feel good. And if your salvation was based upon how your day went or how good or how bad your day was, sometimes I would begin to question if we were saved. But we don't have to base our salvation off of what we feel, but we base our salvation off of what we know written in the Word of God. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead what's the result that we will be saved when we are in obedience to the holy word of God we're living by that word we're standing on that word we're being submissive to the will of God Almighty we can know beyond all doubt that we are saved that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life and when we stand before God on that day of judgment we will hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord what a day that's going to be and we look upon his face and see Jesus Christ the one who saved us from all of our sin if you have your Bible tonight turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 20 Luke chapter 20 for some time on Sunday night we have been studying about the basics of salvation, how we know that we are born again. As I mentioned earlier, salvation is not based upon how we feel. We sing the songs, and, and, and I love some of these choruses that says, I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus in this place. And oftentimes we do. We sing other songs that say, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face surely the presence of the Lord is in this place sometimes have you ever stopped to wonder what would it be like to really feel the brush of an angel's wing I heard Pastor Dan Betzer some time ago he was talking about that very subject and he said that you know if an angel's wing brushed up against you you're going to know beyond all doubt that you have been in the presence of an angel because it'll probably sweep you right on in to the next continent because angels are powerful but when we are in the presence of God it's not based upon how we feel but we can know that we're in his presence because his word says where two or three agree together in his name that he's there so when we come together if there are just two people in this worship center that agree together on praying in the name of Jesus his word assures us that he is there he says call unto me and I will answer he is as close as the mention of his name we say Jesus and he's there so it's more than just feeling it's more than just uh, an emotional experience experience but it's based upon what the word of God says that we know we are in the presence of the Lord and Luke chapter 10 Jesus has sent his disciples out to minister and to the region now at this time there were more than just 12 disciples in the ministry of Jesus because in verse 1 of Luke chapter 10 it says that he is sending out 70 disciples we go from 12 disciples and now there are 70 and he's sending them out in groups of two so we're we're looking at 35 groups of disciples going out into the region can you imagine you know some time ago before Easter we were knocking doors in this community and we were sending people out in groups of two and I believe there was one day we had uh, I believe there was six people so we had three different groups of people that were going out and in two weeks we knocked almost every single door here in the city limits of Howe. Can you imagine what would take place if we had 35 groups of two? We could canvas this entire county probably in one day and that's exactly what Jesus was having his disciples to do and, and not only was he telling them to go out and to proclaim the, the good news of the gospel 
but he was also telling them that he was giving them the power and the authority to minister to the sick and to pray for the sick and they would be healed. But when these disciples returned back to Jesus, they were overwhelmed with what God had done through their ministry. And they came back to Jesus and said, Lord, we, we prayed for the sick and they've been healed. But not only that, but we, out, we, we were praying in your name. And the devils in hell were subject unto us because of your name. And they were overthrilled about the emotional standpoint of how they were able to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and see God do the miraculous and the supernatural. But Jesus had to calm them down, so to speak. And he says, you're missing the point. It's not about seeing all the signs and the wonders. It's not about seeing people healed. It's, it's not about seeing God deliver people and seeing the, the uh, demons cast out because you speak by name. He said, that's not the center point of it all. In verse 20 of Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you. Don't rejoice because you can cast out the demons. Don't rejoice because you're able to pray and God does a miracle. But he says, rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If our name was not written in heaven, none of the other would be possible. Unless we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not going to be able to pray for the sick and see them healed. Unless we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're not going to be able to speak the name of Jesus and see God set people free of demonic power. It's because our name has been written in heaven. And we can know beyond all doubt that our name has been written in heaven. Tonight is our fifth and final week of this study of the basics of salvation. And so far, we've talked about four different parts of salvation. We've talked about conversion, justification, regeneration, and sanctification. Conversion is the ultimate point when we are saved in our life. It is when we call upon the name of the Lord to turn our life around, to change our life. And when we are converted, it's when we repent of our sins. We have faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. We're confessing with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day, and we're believing that God is going to apply the precious blood of Jesus to our life. In addition, when we are saved, when we are converted, there is a voluntary abandonment in our life of the old sinful lifestyle. Many of you have seen soldiers when they're marching in formation and then they're told to about face. They stop the direction they're going. They turn around and they're going a new direction. That's what we do in our life when we are converted. We're turning away from the old sinful lifestyle. We're turning away from the old habits. We're turning away from immorality. We're turning away from the old things of this world. And we're now facing our life toward Jesus Christ. We're doing as the Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When we are converted, it is a new direction in our life. Also, when we are saved, God is the one that justifies us. To be justified means to be set straight, to be made in perfection. You see, when we are justified, it is a reversal of God's attitude toward each one of us because of our new relationship with him. Before we come to know Jesus Christ, God looks upon our life as a sinner. And we know that the word of God says that everyone is sinned. They've all fallen short of the glory of God. And sin comes with a deadly price. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So before we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are looked upon as a sinner destined to spend eternity in hell. But when we know Jesus, that is all changed. God is no longer looking at us as a sinner that's destined to spend eternity in hell, but he is looking at us at a, as a person who has been saved by the grace of God. He's bringing a change in our life. Our record in heaven has been wiped clean by the precious blood of Jesus. The blood has been applied to our life. And now when God looks into our life, all he sees is the blood of Jesus Christ 
in our life, which means that our sins are gone. Our record has been wiped clean. We have been justified. We've been made whole. We've been brought back to God. And our life now is representing just as though we had never sinned in the first place. And it's all brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we are saved, we are converted. We are justified. And third, we are regenerated. When we are regenerated, this is the impartation of the new nature. It's the new beginning. It's a new heart. It's the born again experience. When we come to know Jesus Christ, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are made new. So we are regenerated and turned around when we come to know Jesus Christ. And number four, when we are saved, God sanctifies us. Now, I believe in two steps of sanctification. First of all, when we're saved, we become sanctified instantly. But we also progressively sanctify each day of our life. Because as long as we continue to read our Bible, we pray every day, and we ask God to, to guide us and to direct us, He's continuously sanctifying our life and creating in our life to bring us more into the image of Jesus. Jesus Christ. When we are sanctified, it is a separation. It is a separation from the things of this world. It's a separation from the immoral life. And it's a total separation and a devotion to Jesus Christ. When we are sanctified, we're living a life that's been purified from immorality. We've been cleansed from all evil. We're living a life that is conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I don't want to talk to you about about reconciliation. To be reconciled means to have a restoration, to restore friendship, to restore harmony, to settle a difference, and to submit to a higher authority. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and in verse 17 through 20, the Apostle Paul is writing a message to the church at Corinth, and he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In the very beginning, when God created this world, everything was perfect. The animal world was perfect. The plant life was perfect. The, the ground was perfect. Nature was perfect. And even humanity was perfect. When God first created mankind, there was no separation between God and man. And God was very satisfied with his creation. If you look into the book of Genesis, every time God created something, he looked at what he created and he said, it is good. But God was very satisfied when he created Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1 31, God didn't only just say that it was good, but God saw everything that he had made and he said, behold, it was very good. Why? Because God had just made his masterpiece. Out of everything that he made, he chose mankind to be his masterpiece, created in his own image. And from the very beginning, man and God stood face to face with each other in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were able to communicate with God face to face, just like people communicate and carry on a conversation with each, with each other. Mankind was perfect and innocent in every way. There was no sin. There was nothing in man's heart that would grieve God whatsoever. But sin entered into this world. It was sin that created a separation between God and mankind. 
Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve. And by Adam and Eve giving in to that temptation, they turned their back on God himself by listening to Satan and giving obedience unto him. And because of this sin, God had turned his back on mankind. God had become separated from man. And because of this sin, there was a separation. Death began in the human race because of sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the debt that was due for my sin and for your sin was paid in full by the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. And when he shed his blood, it satisfied the demands of God. And now God has again turned back his face toward mankind. But at the same time, it still remains for man to turn around and to face God and to be brought back into God's loving power. And since God has been reconciled by the death of his son, man is now needing to be reconciled back to God. You see, reconciliation is the ministry of changing completely. It is a restoration of fellowship. Now, who is it that changes? Certainly not God. God is still there. God's always where he's always been. But it's you and I that needs to change. It's mankind that needs to be brought back into fellowship with God Almighty. Let me illustrate this with a real life experience from my own life. And I'll be careful not to get myself in trouble with my wife back there on the camera. But years ago, when Alyssa and I were still young in our relationship and we had not been dating for very long, the vehicle that I drove was an older model. You remember the older vehicles? They had three seat belts in the front seat and you could put three passengers in the front seat of the car. Well, when Alyssa and I had been dating, she would sit in the front seat of the car right next to where I was sitting as I was driving the car. The front seat had seat belts for three front uh, seat passengers and I was behind the steering wheel. I was driving the car and Alyssa would sit in the middle of the front seat right next to me. But today, if you see us driving down the street, we're not sitting next to each other anymore. We never do. In fact, ever since we've been married, we never sat by each other while we're driving down the car. And I highly doubt that we ever will again. And the part that I like about the whole situation is I had absolutely nothing to do with it. You see, she cannot blame me for moving away from her. But obviously, there's been a change. Someone is not sitting where they used to sit. Now, this is what I want you to understand. When she and I started dating, we sat beside each other in the car. I was seated behind the steering wheel, considering the fact that I was driving the car. And today, I'm still seated behind the steering wheel, considering a very precious fact that I'm still steering that car, driving that car in the direction that I want it to go. So here's the question. Who moved? Obviously, I'm still in the same place I've always been. But she is the one that moved. But why? It's because now that I've got this Nissan Roger, or Rogue as you want to call it, the, this car has a console in the middle of the front seat. And that console has come between Alyssa and I and has created a division that separated us from being able to sit next to each other in the car. But all I have to do is reach out my hand to her and she can take my hand and we can still be together despite the division that originally came between us and separated us. And so I, I just told this silly story to illustrate this truth. In the relationship between God and man, in the beginning, there was closeness. There was a sense of intimacy between God and man and humanity. But a separation occurred. Sin entered into this world. Sin separated God and man. And man became separated from God because of that sin. 
But understand, church, God is still in the same place he's always been. He is still on the throne. He is still behind the steering wheel of life. He is still controlling the directions of life. But it is mankind that has allowed ourselves to become separated because of sin coming into our life. But despite that separation, God has made a way. He has created the only way to bridge that division between man and God only by Jesus Christ going to the cross of Calvary. Jesus is the one who opened up the way where mankind could be reconciled back to God. You see, God does not change. God is still where he's always been. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus does not change. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is the sinner, it is the individual person who must change and be brought back to God. It is the sinner who must be reconciled back to God. God is still there. God is not moved. He's still in the same place that he was before. But it's you and I that has to change. We are the ones that have been moved and we must allow ourselves to be drawn back to God. And that is only possible through the grace of God, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We're washed in the blood. We're cleansed of all unrighteousness because of what Jesus did on the old rugged cross. This change is only possible by the cross of Calvary. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23. The Bible says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. You see, it is vital that as, as we grow with Jesus Christ, that we realize it is not God who is reconciled to us. You see, God has not changed. You cannot mold God to conform into your image. But reconciliation begins when we understand that it's us, it's mankind who needs to be conformed into the image of Christ. Our position as human beings of this world changed when Jesus died on the cross. Today, God has his arms outstretched to a lost and dying world so that whosoever will may come. The Bible says that he's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. The worst sinner in this world, regardless of what they've done, it doesn't matter what they've done, it doesn't matter where they've lived, it doesn't matter what kind of mistakes they've made in their life, if they would just come to know Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord and believe upon Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, they too can be saved. You see, there's no one in this world that can change God's mind about you as an individual. No one in this world can separate you from God. No one can change that that one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and Jesus Christ when you become a Christian. No one can change that except you yourself. We have to make up our mind every day of our life that we're going to live for Jesus Christ. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Bible teaches us about a woman who had committed adultery, who was also reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, we see the story. In verse 1 through 11, the Bible says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had sat her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. 
Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and rode on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, the Bible here in this passage of Scripture is not clear about what Jesus wrote on the ground. In fact, it's, it's only speculation. There is a possible clue found in Jeremiah chapter 17 that could give us some insight on what Jesus had written. In Jeremiah 17 verse 13, the Bible says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. It is possible that Jesus was writing the accusers' names and their own sins there in that dusty ground. Maybe all of those people that was bringing this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, maybe they too were guilty of sin. After all, if she was caught in the very act of adultery, why is she the only one that they brought to Jesus? If I'm not mistaken, I believe there should have been someone else that was brought before Jesus. So something crooked has been taking place there. But at any rate, when they brought this woman to Jesus, and Jesus said, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. And, and he began to write in the ground and possibly writing down the names of those people that were gathered around him. Every one of them left very quickly. And the Bible says that Jesus was the only one that was left with her. He was the only one in that whole crowd that was without sin that could have thrown a stone at this woman for her sins. But he did not do so. Verse 11 says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. To me, that sounds like the love of the Savior reaching out his hand to offer forgiveness and saying, I am no longer condemning you. If he is not condemning her, then he is obviously forgiving her. And he's given her a commandment to go and sin no more. The old lifestyle is passed away. It's all been forgiven. And now a new direction has begun to go and sin no more. Now we know that Jesus did not shut his eyes to the woman's transgression. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In the New Living, it says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us the wonderful message of reconciliation. Jesus recognized the sin, but he also died on the cross for that sin. And when we come to Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive us of our sin, he does exactly that. He removes that sin out of our life. The Bible says that it's cast away as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought back up against us again. Only Jesus Christ can do that. It's not by any work that we can do. It's not by might, nor by power, but it's only by His Spirit. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus does not overlook anyone's sin. The Bible is very clear that the wages of sin is death. But we don't have to pay for that sin if we allow the punishment for sin that was placed upon Jesus Christ to be applied into our life. You see, he took our sins to the cross 
So how does that affect us? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In the New Living, it says, So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, Come back to God. When we are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, when Sunday school teachers are teaching the word of God, when we are greeting people as they come into the house of the Lord, when we are preparing meals and serving food to our community, you know what we are doing, church? We are being an ambassador of God Almighty. We are representing who Jesus Christ is in our life to this world. See, when we encourage others to come back to God, we're speaking on behalf of God. We're allowing Jesus Christ to speak through our lives. Can you imagine? You are representing who Jesus Christ is. When you have been saved, when you have been filled with the baptism and the Holy Spirit, God is not only with you, but God is in you. God is working in you. He is working through you. He is working for you. He is working with you. And you are representing Jesus Christ. Not just here in the sanctuary, but when you walk out these doors, you're entering into a mission field. You're entering in into hell's backyard, so to speak. You're entering into a place where you are representing your King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's like a, a, an ambassador going into a foreign land. Sometimes, you know, in, in, in national governments and governments around this world, when a leader is about to take over another country and they're about to make an invasion, oftentimes that nation will send ambassadors in to let the people know what's about to take place and they're representing their uh, one, they're representing their leader, they're representing their uh, government. You see, we are citizens not of this world, but of the world to come. We're citizens of heaven. This world is not our home. We're only passing through. But we're uh, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, representing him in this world. You see, an ambassador is a minister or an official of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government. See, that's how God considers us while we are here on earth. We are a Christian. We're part of the kingdom of God, which is in heaven. And by doing so, we are an ambassador here on earth. We're no stranger to God. But we are a represented a representative of God in this world, literally. And when people look at you, they need to be able to see Jesus Christ in you. Some of you have heard the story. I'll share it again briefly. But for many years, I was involved with one of the largest bus ministries in the nation at Van Buren. Uh, at one time, we were averaging around 26 buses, around 2,500 kids that we were bringing in every Saturday morning, two services, packing out a gymnasium two times on Saturday. And some of you are familiar with Brother Gary Grisham, who was an associate pastor there at Van Buren First Assembly for 40 years. One Saturday, as he was driving that church bus, talking about being a representative of Jesus Christ, being an ambassador of God Almighty, teaching boys and girls about the love of Jesus Christ, as he was driving that bus, taking the kids home on that Saturday, a little five-year-old kid walked down the steps of that bus, turned back up there to Brother Gary and waved at him and smiled and said, Bye-bye, Jesus. I'll see you next Saturday. When you allow the Holy Spirit to flood into your life, people are going to recognize Jesus in you so much that they're going to forget about who you are. And when they see you, they're going to see the power of God in your life. I don't know about you, but I want to get so close to the Lord and represent Him so much that when people see me, they look past my flesh, they look past Daniel Watson, they look past the titles, they look past all of humanity. When they look at me, when people look at you, they need to see who Jesus Christ is. They need to see that you are a living example of who Jesus Christ is. That's, that's why when Jesus told Thomas, He said, when you've seen me, 
you've seen the Father. In other words, Jesus was saying, you know, there's such a oneness, there's such a closeness between my Father and I that if you want to know who the Father is, just look at me and I'll show you who the Father is. If you want to know who Jesus is, church, if people need to know who Jesus is, they need to be able to see Jesus Christ in our life. They need to be able to see the way of salvation through Jesus Christ by the life that we live, by the living example, by a living testimony of how we live our life. You see, as an ambassador, we are working in foreign territory in this worldly culture. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says, But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. You see, the importance of being an ambassador means that we are sent only to a nation where our country has a friendly relationship. See, God is still dealing with this world through his followers. He's still dealing with this world through believers in Jesus Christ. But when God withdraws his ambassadors at the rapture, think about that. When God withdraws his representatives from this foreign nation, God is going to pour out his judgment upon those who are left. An ambassador represents the sovereign power. An ambassador represents the authority that's been placed over him. He doesn't make up his or her own policies, but he follows the will of the one that sent them. You see, there are some believers who really think they can write their own rules and make their own policies. These people are not reconciled to God. There's religions, there's denominations today that try to make up their own way to heaven. They try to make up their own scriptures. The Bible calls it heresy. But a true ambassador of Jesus Christ. How many of you remember the old days of the Assemblies of God? We had, what were they called, CAs, Christ ambassadors. We are Christ ambassadors. That was a little bit before my time, but I was brought up around that time. And then we just changed it to youth ministry. But it's so very true. We are an ambassador. We are a representative of Jesus Christ in this world. As Paul stated, we can know in whom we have believed. We can know that we're saved. It's not based upon how we feel. It's not based upon an emotional experience. But we can know beyond all doubt that our salvation has been confirmed. That we have been converted. That we have been justified. That we have been regenerated. That we have been sanctified. That we have been reconciled to God. And because of that, we can truly say that our life has been cleansed. That our name has been written down in heaven. And we know beyond all doubt that because of our salvation, one day soon we are going to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Can we stand across the sanctuary tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for the precious blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary. Lord, your word says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Lord, you paid the ultimate sacrifice when you died on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, I pray that you will help us as your children. Lord, to never take that sacrifice for granted. To never take your grace for granted. But Lord, to live our life always holy and acceptable before you. To serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. To live our life according to your word. And Lord, we thank you tonight that you have washed us in the precious blood of the Lamb. How many of you know the song tonight? It goes like this. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Sing it with me. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? 
precious blood of the Lamb. Can you lift your hands across the sanctuary? Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, for your precious blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary. Lord, it's by the shedding of your blood, Lord, that forgiveness of sin was made possible to all of humanity. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for your commitment, for your willingness to go to the cross of Calvary, to shed your sinless, spotless blood so that we may have the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we bless your name for all that you have done. We thank you, Lord, because of who you are, that you are our Savior, you're our Redeemer, you're our King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our all in all. And Lord, we give you praise. And Father, I pray that you will go with us now, Lord, that you would lead, guide, and direct in all that we do. Lord, that we may serve you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, to live our lives according to your word. Father, I pray that you will bless and keep us. Lord, that your face may shine upon each one and be gracious to us. Lord, we pray for the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy of all the praise. At the book of Revelation and take it from the beginning to the end, you will see that the rapture takes place before the tribulation breaks out on this earth. Now, I want us to understand that there is a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture of the church is when the dead in Christ will rise and we will rise as well to meet the Lord in the end.